This morning, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 13. As you turn there, I want to tell you a bit of where we are going before we take off. Uh, this morning, I want to show you that in the Bible, God consistently talks about the return of Jesus. He does this because he, continual, he consistently wants you to think about it. And when you do, it will encourage godliness in your life. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Starting in verse 13, we're going to read across the chapter divide into chapter 5 to verse 11. 4, 13. If you would stand with me in reverence for the reading of God's word. The Holy Spirit inspired the author to write these words. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Let us pray. Father, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would give us understanding into this text, and that he would apply this word to our life, that he would continually, consistently, Put the return of Jesus in our eyes. Put it before us that we might test all things, that we might uh, decide all things with it in view. That it would affect everything we say and do and think. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Teaching a kid to walk uh, can be frustrating. You know, you, you stand them up in one spot, right? Like you put them, like you maybe let them put their hands on the couch and you stand them up in one spot and you, and you back up and you, you, you smile with all your might, you know, like you give them the best smile you got, you know, that was a really bad one, but you know, but you, you smile at them and you, and you get their attention and maybe you got like a little toy or something and you're like shaking it in front of their face and you know, they're smiling back because that's what they do, you know, and they're, they're like really cheesing and and you got them, and you're, you're saying, you're saying, come on, come on. You know, you're looking them right in the eye. And, you know, if they start to look away, you're kind of like getting over in front of their eyes. And you're saying, come on, come on. And, uh, and you know, they're looking, and, and right as they get ready to take a step, right? Like right as they, you know, because they kind of like lean way over. And, you know, so right as they get ready to take a step, it's like, oh, did 
the dog's tail is wagging. I want to grab it, right? Or, or it's like, oh, there's, there's a cookie under the, under the couch. I want to eat it. Or, or the, like, it's like, you know, there, there's that new toy that grandma bought that makes all the noise, and I want to smash it. And, and so then they, you know, they, they drop and they scoot, right? Like, that's, you know, they scoot or they, or they crawl. And so you go over and you get them again and you stand them back up. And you back up again, and you get right, you know, you get down, and, and you, you start trying to get them to come. And, but every time you get them, and you get their attention, they, they look away. And they, they forget where they're going. Uh, they forget what's before them. And they're distracted by something else. In the Bible, God consistently puts the return of Jesus in front of our eyes. He consistently puts the return of Jesus in front of our eyes. He looks you in the face and he says, look here. Look at this day in the future. Look at this day that Jesus is going to return. Focus here. Don't know. Don't look away. Look at it. Remember this. Make every decision and say everything that comes, that, that every word that comes with this in mind. But then something, something tempts you. Something hurts. You, you get bored. Or you have a problem and we look away. We forget that our Lord is coming back for us. When you look away and you forget that Jesus is coming back for you, today's issues seem so big before our eyes. Our troubles look like mountains. Our temptations look like diamonds. But when you put them in, the compar in comparison with the return of Jesus, with that day when he comes in his glory, they're only specks of dust. Everything you do and think is to be influenced by the knowledge that Jesus will return. Everything you do and think is to be influenced by the knowledge that Jesus will return and make all things right. God in the Bible consistently talks about the return of Jesus because he wants us to consistently think about the return of Jesus. If you look at how much the Bible talks about the return of Jesus, how, if you look at how often he, the Bible talks about it, and then you think about how much you think about it, we fall short. We know that Jesus will return. Raise your hand if you believe that Jesus one day will come back. Don't know what it is, but absolutely, everybody in the room, awesome. We're doing good. Now raise your hand if you thought about it yesterday. Or this morning, or last week, or last month. My bet is there's a whole lot less hands. We know it will happen, but we don't think about it much. We don't talk about it much. Notice that in this text, it has a present purpose. Every future text has a present purpose. You know, he begins, he begins our text today. By saying that well, we don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who fall asleep, that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Notice it has a present purpose. Even if you look at verse 18, halfway through our text, it says, therefore comfort one another with these words. Verse 11 in chapter 5, the ending of our text says, therefore encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. We should use this truth. To consistently encourage, comfort, build up one another. Because God in his word consistently uses it to do just that. Everything you do and think is influenced by the knowledge that Jesus will return. What about the waitress who, who gets it all wrong? Or what about the man who just doesn't do his job as you would expect? What about when somebody says something mean to you? 
You should have the return of Jesus in mind. You are looking at this current situation that has you just hot and bothered. Like, that just has you messed up and frustrated. You have that in mind. Because we're people. It's right there in front of us. We can't get it out of our mind. It's just bothering us. But you should also have in mind the return of Jesus. The day he returns for you. And the day he returns for this person. And this is going to help you put it in its place and to respond more like Jesus because you could think that the slight given you, the inconvenience, is warrant to treat a person like trash. Or you could remember that Jesus will return one day and recall the truth of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and so many other passages like it and realize that loving them and showing them the grace of Jesus is so much more important. Will it matter on that day that you gave her a piece of your mind? Or will you wish that you had shown her grace? I'm asking you, in view of this glorious day, please lay down the petty things and don't let your inconveniences steal an opportunity to show the glory of God and to make someone else's world a better place. They may not appreciate it. And oftentimes, they will not. They may not realize that you have been kind to them. They may not realize how much you had to fight inside. How much you had to fight off the temptation to allow your pride and your ego not to come out. You might have, they, they will never realize the fight that you had to have inside. The fight you had to have to die to yourself and to live in Christ Jesus in this moment and to remember that he is going to return with you, for you, and that in comparison to that day, that this slight, this inconvenience, this trouble, this pain, this temptation is nothing but a speck of dust. It won't matter tomorrow. It won't matter in a minute. And it definitely won't matter in 8 billion years when I stand beside Jesus. Please don't look away. When you know that God has your eternal security in Jesus, that frees you to forget about yourself and to start living to love other people and helping them to know Jesus. Isn't that so much more important? When they stand, where will they stand when the trumpet is blown? Isn't that so much more important than the need to be right or to get things just like you want them? Your everyday interactions are important. Your everyday interactions, just that word that you say, things that we brush off so easily, Things that other times, sometimes it's not easy for people to forget. They have eternal consequences. And that's why we must keep in mind the day that Jesus returns. That's one of the reasons that God consistently puts it in front of our eyes and asks us not to look away. You know, the return of Jesus is specifically mentioned more than 60 times in the 26 books of the New Testament. More than 60 times in the 26 books of the New Testament. Every New Testament author points to the return of Jesus at some point in their writing. This morning, before we, before we focus on 1 Thessalonians 4, I want to show you a sampling of text where God points our minds, our eyes, to the return of Jesus and show you that today's text is not just an instance of teaching, Not just a momentary thought, but that it is consistently, more than 60 times in the New Testament, put before our eyes. So we're just going to sample some and see what God has to say. Now I want you to turn to these with me. John 14. This one's a, a more familiar one. Turn with me to John 14. 
you go back just a little bit towards the, towards the middle of the Bible, John 14. give you time to get there because I want you to see it. John 14, we're going to read 1 and 3. I want you to notice also that this text begins with the words, do not let your heart be troubled. It has a present purpose. Jesus speaking to the disciples right after he has told them that he's going to leave them, that he's going to go where they're going where he's going that they cannot follow. And this has distressed them. This is, their, this is their leader. This is their God. This is their Savior. This is the one they have followed and they have really given up their lives for. And Jesus speaks these words. John 14, starting in verse 1, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. When they're troubled, he points them to the return of Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start reading verse 16. The whole Sermon on the Mount is built on the motivation of being with God in his kingdom when Jesus returns. That's what every, every command he gives in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, which is the whole Sermon on the Mount is kind of a, imagine it as a painting. Jesus is taking and he's painting for them a picture of what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And that's really what the Sermon on the Mount is. He's showing them what it looks like to live as part of the kingdom of God. And you know what motivation he consistently gives throughout this text? The return eternity, the future. Not, not things today, but eternity. Matthew 6, starting in verse 16. He says, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Notice they're looking for a reward, a treasure today. They want to be noticed by people today. Truly I say to you, they will have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by the Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, well what, what type of reward? What, what do we need to know about that reward? Let's continue on in verse 19. Do not st store up for yourself treasures on earth, don't have your focus on today. Don't worry about the results of today. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where the moth and the rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Right? For us, that's not on this side of Jesus' return. That puts our, our focus on the return of Jesus because that's the dividing point between this life and the next. When we will be with him in his kingdom, and his kingdom has come completely, and he, he comes back for us. Store up treasures for that day where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Focus on the treasures of eternity and not on the things of this world. We need to know. Because you know, as we talk about things, often we say this wrong. You are an immortal. All right? You're not a mortal. Like, like this life is the only thing that matters. Your physical body is mortal. It, it, it will die, right? But you are not. Our bodies will die unless Jesus comes back first. However, you, what, what's in there, what, what actually makes you you, what God cares about, what God has saved, is immortal. It's eternal. So make today this moment about storing up eternal treasures in God, about preparing for God. How sad it is to watch men and women run around and never enjoying anything that God is giving them, and nor ignoring the pleas of God. The pleas of God to look up 
Every day you put so much blood and so much sweat and so many tears into building this life. You sacrifice so much building sandcastles only to watch them washed away when the tide comes in. Are you building a sandcastle? Remember the words of Romans 12, 19. God tells his people to not take revenge because he will return evil. And when will he do that? When Jesus, is, when Jesus returns. So the motivation today for not taking revenge is what? Once again, return of Jesus. He consistently points our eyes to the return of Christ. One more text I want you to see. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. You say, why are we going through all these texts? Why aren't we just focusing on our one for today? It's because I want you to see that this is consistently thought through, taught throughout the Bible. We're only looking at, uh, with the last one that I just mentioned, we're going to look at four. Our text for today is five, but there's more than 60 instances in the New Testament. He consistently talks about it because he wants us to consistently think about it. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse 7 and read through verse 14. Seven through verse 14. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as a loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them to be rubbish so that I may gain Christ. And may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ the righteous, which, righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. That I might know him and the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings be conformed to his death. In order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Which happens when? When Jesus returns. Now that I have already obtained now not that I have already obtained it, or have already become perfect, but I press on that I might take hold of that for which I have laid hold of, have, which I also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself to have, have as having laid hold of this yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is the prize that he's putting everything else aside for? What is the one thing that he considers everything else rubbish for? It is to be with Christ. In verse 11, he ends his description of how he wants to be with Christ when he points us to the resurrection of the dead, which happens when Jesus comes back. And then in verse 14, right at the end of our text, this one prize that he drops everything else for is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Greek word there is translated upward. It's concerning direction. It literally is referring to when we have to go up with Jesus in the second coming. Paul is telling us not to look away from the return of Jesus. Do not look away from the return of Jesus. But instead, drop everything. Consider everything else rubbish. Having your one prize, your goal, your thing that you strive for to be in the return of Christ. That which he has accomplished for us and that which he has made secure for us. Our text for today is not an abnormality. But simply another teaching in a long line of biblical text calling us to keep the return of Jesus before our eyes. Do not look away from it. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4.13 and see what God has for us there today. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 This is a great text for understanding what the return of Jesus will be like. Because, you know, there are a lot of cryptic, difficult to understand passages concerning the return of Jesus, right? Daniel and the Revelation are both, uh, both God's word. They're both uh, inerrantly truthful. But they are a 
apocalyptic text, they're apocalyptic literature, that's what type of writing they are, and so they use a lot of images, and they don't generally explain their meaning, although they do sometimes. So it is best to use passages such as this one to build an understanding of the return of Jesus when we can. Because it is clearly written, it is prose. The type of writing it is is not figurative, it's not, um, it, it's not veiled, it is plain. 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 13. We're going to read through verse 18 and start out with. I just want to point out a few, few clear teachings in this passage. But we do not want to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Notice in verse 15 that he says that this is the word of the Lord. Now, we know that the entire Bible, all of Scripture, is inspired. It is the word of the Lord. So why point that out specifically here? It's because this is something that Jesus was known to speak of. These are, these are things that Jesus spoke of when he were here. That's what it means when it's saying specifically these are the, the words of the Lord. It's meaning that he spoke these this teaching when he was with us. We see that Jesus talked a lot about his return. Do you know that Jesus speaks more about hell than any other person in the Bible? We have more references, more speaking about hell by in the Gospels, out of the mouth of Jesus, than we do in the whole rest of the Bible. He consistently pointed people's eyes to his return. We saw one place in John 14. Another prominent place is Matthew 24. And did you know that 12 of Jesus' parables, more than a quarter, are all focused on his return? You know, the main lesson that Jesus gives us, the main lesson we have in this passage today is simply that Jesus will return. Jesus will return and he will make all things right. That should be something that you think about every day. You know, a good practice for you, I'm going to give you a couple of exercises today. You know, we won't call them homework, we'll call them exercises. Okay, they just sound a little better. So, i uh, give you some homework. The, the first one that I want you to do is I want you to find ways to remind yourself of the return of Jesus. So, I want you to make a couple little notes. You can use like these little sticky notes, you know, like little square sticky notes, or, or, or whatever you need to do. And... Uh, somewhere where you're at, for long, you're looking at for long periods of day, maybe it's your computer at work, maybe it's uh, on the dash of your car, uh, maybe it's your mirror, your mirror uh, that you get ready in front of in the morning, uh, whatever it might be. I want you to take a note, and I want you to, to at least put the simple truth that Jesus will return. Just remind yourself. I mean, ideally, to remind yourself throughout the day. Another important practice is to make sure that we're reading the scriptures every day. Because like I said, it consistently points us to the return of Jesus. Consistently. It'll be hard to do many days of reading the scriptures without it pointing you to the return. And reminding you. Think about how this would change your outlook every day. Think about how it would change your decisions, how, how you would change the way you treat people. If everything you thought and everything you said and everything you did was in, with, with the return of Jesus in view. So many things that worry you now wouldn't seem so important, would they? Or, or things that you don't have time for would suddenly seem monumental. Remember as often as you can that Jesus will come back. The second lesson I want you to remember out of this is that Jesus will judge. Jesus will judge. When he comes back, 
He is going to raise the dead. And those who believe in him and belong with him will join him. And then those who are alive will follow them and be with him as well. The implication is that those who are not in him will be cast away. From the time he made you, there will not be a time that you do not exist. You get one shot. This one moment in eternity, make it count. Your short time here on earth will echo through eternity. James 4.14 says that we are a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You will bear the results of this life forever and ever. When you leave this place, this is exercise number two. When you leave this place, I want you to, to do, do something else. Another thing. To remember your post-it notes. I want you to remind yourself that you're immortal. That your body will die, but you will not. Remind yourself that Jesus is going to return and then think about the way you spend your time. Think about the things that you think about. Think, think about the things that you talk about. And I want you to take, take some paper and I want you to sit down. This is going to take some self-evaluation, self something we don't do enough that we need to do more of. We need to, we need to think about those things. And I want you to list out the things that you think about, the things that you talk about, the things that you spend your time on. What, what are those things? And then I want you to ask yourself the question, in 8 billion years, am I going to care about these things? And then I want you to make another list. And I want you to ask yourself the question, what will I wish I did more of in 8 billion years when I stand with Jesus in his kingdom? What will I wish that I did more of? In a billion years, you're not going to care what you were wearing. You're not going to care about, about how good you were at that game on your phone. You're not going to care about how many deer you killed or how many movies you've seen or how comfortable your couch was. But the time you spent with your kids, discipling them and showing Christ Jesus to them and building your relationship with them. The time you spent with God and His Word and talking to Him. Oh my, how much joy are you going to have with the people that you shared Christ Jesus with and that you loved and that you cared for them when they needed you? And don't give me the busy line. Busyness is merely a matter of priorities. All that means is that you had a whole day worth of things that you would rather do than read the Bible or serve someone else. For some reason, we would rather play in the dust than reach for Jesus and the stars. Let's end this text this morning. 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's finish our text out this morning. Starting in verse 1. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. Suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are sons of the light and sons of the day, and we are not of the night nor of the darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Jesus will return like a thief in the night. You will not expect it. Anyone who tells you that they have worked out a time or a date for the return of Jesus is a liar, and they're generally just trying to sell books. God says that it will come like a thief in the night. You won't know what to expect it. That means that you have to be ready. You don't put anything off. Jesus may come back tomorrow, that's true. He might. Or you might die tomorrow. Yeah, I think one of the important jobs we have as pastors that we probably don't do enough, I mean, because it's not pleasant, 
It, it doesn't make us popular, I guess. But one of the important jobs we have to do is to remind you that you are going to die. That is going to happen. And that you need to be ready. He says it will come like the labor pains of a pregnant woman. Something you know is coming. But somehow it is still a surprise. It's like a jack in the box. You know, you twist the handle and you wait and you wait because you know it's coming. But somehow it still surprises you. If you've never given him your life, if you've never believed in him, do not look away. Keep this picture in your mind and know that you are never going to be good enough to stand at his judgment. Jesus Christ is your only hope. He paid, he died to pay the penalty that you deserve and he rose again from the dead to give you life. Now trust in him and make him your Lord and know that on that day you will be with him. You know, we're like the kids sit in the window and they, they wait for the return of their dad from work, right? They, they know it's about time. They sit in the window and they watch and they wait and, and they, they see his truck pull in and he and he comes down the driveway, and they, they, they see him coming, and as soon as they see him coming, they, they, they come out and they run out the door, and when he gets home, they, they, he gets out of the truck, and they, and, they, and they jump up and they grab his neck. Live, live every day of your life watching for him, expecting him, preparing for him to return. And get ready to run to him. Let's pray.